everyone. First of all, let me start by uh, thanking uh, Roger and Aral and all of the volunteers here to uh, have put together an incredible event, a great program, incredible venue too. Um, and really thank you for inviting uh, Safeguard and me to address uh, all of you uh, this morning. I'm just getting technology to work here. Um, as you can tell, I am not from South California. Um, I am not from Canada either. <laughs> um, I uh, I brought my um, my accent is uh, is legacy code I brought with me from France, and uh, just like legacy code is very difficult to uh, get rid of. So we'll uh, we'll deal with it for the the next uh, few minutes. Before I get into the talk, I'd like to uh, introduce SafeCode because uh, SafeCode and OWASP have a lot in common. I think SafeCode and OWASP are maybe the only two organizations that are focused on building secure code, application security, and all of the techniques around this. SafeCode was created um, more than 10 years ago um, by a um, big technology company, Microsoft, Intel, and Dell EMC, Adobe, CA Technology, Symantec, Siemens. It also includes members uh, representing big technology users like, like Boeing, a security company, you know, like Veracode or Synopsys. And um, what is uh, unique about SafeCode is that all members share a mutual NDA. So there is a lot of sharing going on among members about practices, what works, what doesn't work. And as an organization, the goal is to document these practices, to publish online training, um, and to really share it with the community to raise the level of um, secure development and secure coding across, across the industry. So if you go to the website, you can find paper on threat modeling, you can find paper on, on third-party component management, as an example, and much more. The executive director of SafeCode is uh, someone I'm sure many of you know, uh, if you are in this field, Steve Lipner was the person behind uh, the Microsoft security push 15 years ago, has since retired from Microsoft and uh, joined, joined SafeCode. So what, um, you know, what I want to talk to you about today is really about flipping, flipping the script and, and looking at threats with, through the eye of an application security practitioner. What, um, you know, all of us here are passionate about defending against advanced threat. We're also passionate about technology. You know, we know everything about defense in depth, about cross-site scripting, speculative execution now even. And, um, and all, you know, all of us here enjoy, enjoy the technical talk. What I'm going to talk to you about is about culture. Not about Nouvelle Vague or Saint-Germain-des-Prés, you know, some cultural um, places, but more about, um, for the next 30 minutes, what I'd like to do is to step back and to look at the advanced threats, to look at the software security world um, with uh, different lenses and really get, get to think about how we can face the, same, the next challenge which is ahead of us. So to start, Let's look at the cybersecurity market today. It is a huge market. Hundreds of billions of dollars are being spent in tools and services, you know, from antivirus to advanced defense to threat detection. All of these tools, um, you know, highly popular and, and the growth, you know, it, it's a market that has grown uh, year after year after year. But these tools sometimes Make, make us lose sight of the big picture. If you look at um, most successful attacks from the Maurice Swarm in 1988, which was the first publicly known exploitation of a buffer overflow, to more recently WannaCry or the Experian Bridge, most of these attacks are root cause into a design flaw or a software vulnerability. And you, you, you guys know a lot about this. You know, for 15 years, you have been publishing the OWASP top 10, you know, year after year, 
and um, and 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 this has been tremendously useful to help guide all of us practitioners, you know, through doing the right thing. But the bottom line is that tools alone cannot cannot help us prevent vulnerability. Because preventing vulnerability requires a process, holistic process. And tools are useful, they help us, they enable us to do that. But money can't buy software security. So does it mean that we are lost, we won't succeed? You know, we are in a capitalistic society? Um, not at all. In fact, I would contend that we have gone a long way. As a, you know, look back 15, 20 years, we have really gone a long way. I love this picture, by the way. It, it, it reminds me of um, a joke we have in France. Uh, it's a little kid asking um, his dad, hey, daddy, is America far away? And the dad answers, shut up and swim. Tais-toi et nage. <laughs> and this is, this is a metaphor for where we are as an industry. You know, we have gone a long way. You know, we know what it takes to develop secure code. We, we know we need to do threat modeling, we know we need to do testing, we need to do static code analysis, we know all of these things. But we still have, you know, um, a, a, a long way to go. And what we are struggling with is really, how do we, how do we do it at scale? So, before we address that point, now is a good time to introduce the three, what we call the three horsemen of software security. A group of st stakeholders, you know, that, um, that have the most influence on shaping software security and, th and that have had influence over, uh, over time and will continue to have influence in shaping how software security is being adopted. The first one, obviously, is a software developer. Is at the end of the day, the developer is the one that creates the code, whether it's for an open source project, for, for his or her employers, or for her as a hobby, creates the code you know, that we end up being, uh, being the software we want to secure. The second stakeholder is the development organization. That's the organization that takes the code, takes the software, and turn it into a product or a service. It could be a cloud service, it could be a package product, it could be an internal business enabling application. And, and, and basically sell it, you know, to solve business problems. And then the third stakeholder is a technology, is a technology user. It could be my mom using her tablet, you know, or it could be a multi-billion dollar organization dealing with billions of do, you know, billions of transactions every day. Doesn't matter. There's always a technology user that is buying these products, these services, and that has huge influence of the on the market. So today, I thought it would be a perfect day to deliver a state of the union <laughs> and talk about where we are as an industry into helping these stakeholders uh, deliver better software security. So let's start with the developer. I, I've been in this field for more than 15 years now. And I can tell you, you know, the amount of resources that was available then and is available now is night and day. If you are an informed software developer, you have access to tons of resources to develop secure code. Whether it's o OWASP guidance, you know, whether it's safe code uh, training, I triple uh, you know, secure design document. There are tons and tons of guidances available to help developers develop secure code. What is missing today is how to make these resources used and adopted by more developers at scale. That's our challenge, you know. But the resources do exist. If you look at development organization, mature development organization understand that developing secure software is a holistic process. That there is nothing like unbreakable software. This was 15 years ago. Now we don't talk about that anymore. You know, we, 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 we have 
it has been broadly documented, you know, from the Microsoft SDL, OWASP Open SAM, the safe code fundamental practices, what a secure development process look like. And these this methodology are being updated all the time. But mature development organizations know what it takes and how to do it. Our next challenge is to get this process adopted by all software development organizations. Talking about process, in fact, I wanted to share with you a preview, uh, a document that several of you in the room have contributed to. Uh, SafeCode will release its updated fundamental practice in the coming weeks. Um, this is a preview of the table of content. I'm not going to take you through it, but I uh, wanted to uh, put a plug here. Um, I'm sure as a practitioner, you already a lot of these things, but documenting it helps spread the word and update, you know, with uh, the latest latest practice that the members have been uh, using. Moving to the technology user. Technology user and the most sophisticated one understand that um, it is much more effective, you know, if you do risk management and risk assessment, it's much more effective to assess the process a vendor uses to develop a software than to, uh, to, to, to assess the software itself. You know, what you, what you see, you see a trend in the market here where increasingly uh, questionnaires are being created, uh, certification is emerging. That, that is focused on, the of, on assessing the vendor software development process. FSI SAC has put a questionnaire out based on BSIM. SafeCode has developed a framework for buyer and seller uh, to use. And also very promising is ISO 27034, which is a new standard solely focused on, on assessing and certifying a, a, a development organization software development process. These tools are really representing what we believe is the future of software security assessment from a, uh, uh, from a buyer standpoint and uh, all great promises. So the bottom line is that when you look at software security, the state of our union is very, very strong. And all of you have contributed to it, you know, um, we, we, we all know what it takes. Our next challenge is scale. Developers now, you know, are coming by the millions. Um, there are billions of connected devices, cars, hotel keys, um, um, whatever you have in your pocket must be connected. You know, everything becomes connected and software manages this connection. Every single, you know, human being is becoming a technology user. And the challenge for us is that there are only thousands of us. On one side, it's good. It's good, you know, it's job, job protection. You know, we'll be employed. But it will not solve the software security problem. To solve it, we need to start looking at at new approaches. We need to start looking at the levers that we can use to change the behavior of these stakeholders. And, 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 and at the end of the day, what we do want is change the behavior of an entire industry. And this is where culture comes into play. We need to change the culture of the software industry so that um, so that security is more at the center. Why culture matter? Because, because culture drives community behavior. Again, taking a French-American example. You know. In America, you know, where success is often measured by, by money, you measure the success of a movie by its gross revenue. In France, where um, money is one element, but not the only one. Success of a, m a movie is measured by how many people are coming to watch it. Same things, different measurements, different culture. Culture drives community behavior. Culture defines what's good and what's bad. Culture helps shape decision making. So if there are ways, and if we can identify ways to change the culture across the, the stakeholders, will go a wrong way towards scaling software security. We often call, you know, 
the culture of a, a, a community, the culture code. So what we want to do here is to change the software culture code. So if you look at our three stakeholders, what should be our destination? You know, the, the developers today, you know, are well trained to care about performance, to care about uh, reliability. This is part of what you learn in engineering schools when you develop software. We need to start elevating security and maybe pervasive and be looked at like performance and like reliability by software engineers. For development organization, you know, development organization, software development organization are well all machine when it comes to managing quality, to producing predictable schedule for software development. Sometimes they miss it, but to try, try to, to work out, to put quality in the process and to put the oversight that you need with quality. We need development organizations to start looking at security and integrate security in these quality machines that they have put in place for themselves. Technology users have a huge influence on the market. You know, they set the market expectations. We need to get them to look at security in the same way as they are looking at other cool features that they may be looking at in products. So in preparation for this keynote, back in, um, back in November, I reached out to the SafeCode community and asked them, how could we do that? What are the culture change agents that you have used yourself within your own organization or we should use as an industry to change the culture of software and put security at the center of it. And I got some very interesting feedback and responses from, uh, from many members. I packaged that into 10 considerations and put into two buckets. Things we can do, all of us, you know, when we go back to work on Thursday, you know, after two days of great event, um, and apply. And things that are more far-reaching that will need us to 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 collaborate and push as change across the industry. So the next ten slides are these ten considerations. That's what the second part of the keynote is about. Let's start with the steps which are concrete that we can all take as um, in our work in our own organization to change to change what's going on. The first one is not a surprise. It's and by far, it was the overwhelming response I received from the SafeCode member. You cannot change the culture of an organization if you don't have executive sponsorship. Now, everybody will say that. Let's think about what it means. It doesn't mean that you need to have the CEO and the board expect in cross-site scripting, expert, excuse me, in cross-site scripting. What it has meant for many, many of us is that we have identified one influential executive. I, in one case, it was a CTO. You know, in another case, it was the president of the customer service organization. It doesn't matter who, is, who it is, as long as it's an influential executive that understands that the company cannot succeed if they don't put software security at the front of the priority. So if you are a security practitioner, you know, think about what software security practitioner, think about what it may mean. Do you have this person in your organization? And if you don't, maybe there are things you can, you, you can do here. And, and this is not the only thing when you talk about executive support. What we are also finding is that very often, even software engineering leaders and executives are not well trained about the business impact of vulnerability. They don't understand the impact that shipping software with vulnerability may have. Understanding the black market that does exist where vulnerabilities are being traded. Understanding the sophistication of the attacker and how attacks are highly, sof highly sophisticated attack and exploit any weaknesses in software. 
training leaders uh, on engineering organization on on um, on the business impact of software vulnerability is another key steps to take as you are building the uh, executive awareness to change the culture of an organization. The second one and the second type of population that we, we are finding is very, very influential are the project or program manager that are driving the software development process in an organization. This group of indi individuals are not the technical expert, but they hold the playbook that, that really define how an organization develops software. A if you can partner with these groups and insert the right security activity at the right time, the right gate and the right check, what you will find out is that security is being done seamlessly because it's part of the playbook. I can talk from experience. When, you know, 10 years ago, EMC grew through acquisition. We acquired a lot of company, 20 in a short amount of time. And at some point when we brought this company together, there were decisions made that we, st we need to start defining a common way of developing software, common gates, common deliverables. Day one, we were able to put security in the playbook. It was a massive change in adoption overnight. Security was started to be driven by project manager, program manager across the organization. And this helped us tremendously. The third consideration is technical. When you want to change the culture of an organization, you have to look at the QA organization. For reasons that I don't understand, we consider security testing to be different from regular testing. And, and here we have, all have in any development organization, teams of engineers who are trained in testing. Having them learn about security testing and own the security testing plan as part of an organization testing strategy goes, goes a long way towards raising the bar. Does not replace penetration testing. Let's be clear about that. There are specific expert skills that you, 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 you get from penetration testing. But driving a cure organization um, to do security testing is highly effective. It, 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 will, it will save you money, it will provide better, better, better security quality, and it also provides a development path for QA engineers learning new skills which, uh, which, which, which creates happy employees. The second part of this is to start treating vulnerability for what they are. They are bugs. And if you look at vulnerability as bugs, and if you look at how most organizations manage bugs today, there are severity definition, which again, for, for obscure reasons, only looked at the impact of a bug on, in terms of software functionality, not in terms of security impact. Reviewing your severity definition of your bug definition to have sec security severity in the definition helps provide the visibility you need on, on this. And, and, and provide a KPI um, in the reports that are going to, to, to management and executive management. And most of the time, software engineering leaders, when they have the information, they make the right decision. Today, they don't have it when you treat security differently from a bug. Back to the technical community uh, in the organization, we need to start rethinking education. Training developers on software security is much more than just buying online courses and tracking participation. If you want all of your developers and security to be pervasive around, among your developers, you need to, to build a plan to raise the proficiency of the development organization. This is not just taking online courses. This includes, includes workshops, does include projects, you know, if you have to do a threat modeling for a team, why don't you do it as a training workshop rather than alone in your office to teach people how to do it, to see the results? 
If you have to do security testing, why don't you do it with a QA organization to show them how to do it and do knowledge transfer? Raising the proficiency of a development organization takes years, but is well worth the investment and a great way to change the technical culture. So we talked about you know, executive management and, and governance. We talked about the technical community. Let's go to HR. Who would have thought that HR could be part of the solution? <laughs> but they are. If you start, if you start putting security requirements in your software development job posting, you are going to, to, to have two direct benefits. Number one, your own software developer will, if they are not already, will, be, will have a motivation to learn about security and you, you will have a higher skilled workforce. Force. Number two, you are sending a very strong signal to college and university that, that the market cares about security and they better train software engineers to learn about security if they want to be competitive on the market. So if all of us here take that back home and talk to our HR department about that, we can help, help raise the level of our own organization as well as the level of the market. So to finish this first set of recommendation and consideration, this is, I think, number six. Um, the last stop is the procurement department. And this is, again, a way for all of us, you know, to, uh, to help raise the market expectation. If we go to our procurement de department and start working with them on the security criteria they need to put in contracts, we will make a major push to the market. But let's be clear. You have the right criteria and you have the wrong criteria. Please don't ask your vendors for source code. It's a waste of time, number one, you know, and number two, they will not give it to you. Don't ask for your vendor to certify that they don't have any vulnerability in their code. Because they do. Because every software has bugs, and a small subset of these bugs are vulnerability. That's a fact of life. But do ask them for their process. Do ask them how they are, what governance they have in place. This will give you great insight into their capability and push the right motion uh, into, into the market. What's interesting here is that when you think about how we can influence the market today, the market is really reacting to two things. The wallet, you know, on one side, and high-profile hacks. We could all spend our day, you know, going and hacking credit agency you know, the remaining one, you know, to scare the heck out of the market and raise the profile. But my legal department advised me against it. So what's left is to work with the procurement agencies. So for the last part of, of, of this presentation, I'd like to go a little bit more far-reaching, get into um, aspects and, and changes we would like to see that we all need to consider for the long run. And the first one of, of this change, something dear to my heart, is education. I mentioned earlier that uh, I talked earlier about the Maurice Worm in 1988, you know, the first publicly known exploitation of a buffer overflow. So 1988, Reagan was a president. Um, some of you here in the room were not born. I can see a few heads nodding. 30 years later is the anniversary this year. Maybe we should have a big celebration for the anniversary of the Maurice Swarm in those 30 years. Um, but 30 years later, we are still graduating students from software engineering colleges and boot camps who have not been exposed to software security. It doesn't make any sense. We, we, you know, some colleges have started to put security as an elective. That's good, but that's not sufficient. Let's be clear. We want security as, 
as a mandatory component of any software engineering degree. Just like food safety is a mandatory component of culinary school for training chef, or just like you, I hope, you learn uh, fire safety in building engineering schools. We absolutely need to drive this change. We are all alumni of some schools. We have sons and daughters um, in colleges. We all need to drive this change. It is just incredible that we are not doing that. The second change we, we would like to consider has to do with application lifecycle management tool vendor. Again, for reasons which I don't understand, we have two markets that are going in parallel. We have application, so application lifecycle management tools, you know, um, for developers, and we have application security tools that are developing in parallel. Developers love tools. Not the security one. They love the, 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 the application lifecycle management tools. If we can start putting security as a feature of these tools, we will put it in the face of the developer whether they like it or not. And, you know, I, I upload what GitHub did recently where they integrated in, um, in their IDE, in their component dependency, uh, function, vulnerability checking. We need more of that. And we need it to be enabled by default. We don't want to wait for the developer to switch it on. But there is no reason to school an inhibitor at scan, so, uh, scanning code, at finding vulnerabilities. Security has to become a feature of these application lifecycle management tools. This will raise the bar across the industry. And if you are an application security tool vendor, don't worry. I have something for you too. You know, um, we need our application security tool to become smarter. Think about it. We have been in this. We have been tracking software security and application security for 15 or 20 years. We have massive amount of data. If Amazon can predict what is my next purchase. How come we cannot predict that the software will fail from a security standpoint with artificial intelligence, with machine learning? We need our brightest mind while developing security tool to stop doing faster code scanner and start developing tools that are really, really helping cha cha change the industry. A great example is threat modeling. Later, there will be a great threat modeling panel you know, with some of the most expert people in threat modeling in the industry. But not everyone, you know, has an ISA or a Brook or an Adam on his staff to do threat modeling. We need, we need tools to do that. And if I was a VC and someone came to me with a project around threat modeling tools, they'd get my vote. So number 10 on the list, and the last one, is really looking at the research. We have um, Google, Facebook are doing some interesting work around developing, you know, compile time security or, or run times that are security aware that a uh, developer can, can, can use, you know, when they develop their, their application. And this is great. We need more of that. But keep in mind, the world is not just about web application. We are developing software for embedded devices, for operating systems, for firmware. We, we need our, our, our brightest computer scientists and researchers to find and, de and, and, and define lo programming languages that are s more security smart. And not things like I learned at school when I was a kid that only a PhD can use. We need languages which can be used by everyone. Doesn't have to be perfect security. Remember, this is all about, you know, raising the bar. It's not about 100% per, proved security. But this is our next challenge. We need to raise the bar. And if we 
I, if the, our research community, our research lab were able to come up with some more powerful languages and runtime, I think our life would be much easier. So this is the end of my list. You know, there is no number 11. But uh, I hope you can, you know, um, reflect o o on this discussion and really look at what is our next challenge. Obviously, we, need, we continue to need and we need more technical experts. But when you look at the future of software security and, and, and the challenge that is facing us in terms of the scale of, of, of software and what is ahead of us, we need to start thinking about influencing other stakeholders. You know, the human resource department, the universities, the colleges, all of these organizations that I just named. And, and this is really why, you know, we talked about culture change. It is about bringing security at the center of the software culture. And all of us here, we can help one way or another in our own organization or outside, you know, help flip that script, you know, and solve the software security problem. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm sure we have time for a few questions. Thank you. Anyone? Yes, sir. It was a it was a great talk. You talk about uh, enabling QA organizations to do security testing. As a consultant, I've seen about a ninety percent failure rate of tr organizations trying to do that. So, do you have any thoughts on what it takes to do this successfully? Let me tell you what I've done in my own organization, you know, which, um, so the, the way we have done it is that we have created uh, six weeks workshops where we take one expert security tester that we align with a specific QA group. And during these six weeks, the tester will spend 80% of the time trying to break the software, 20% of the time doing knowledge transfer with the QA team. Obviously, this is done with threat model at hand, a lot of knowledge, you know, it's a collaborative effort. But that's what we have been doing, and we are finding that it's working quite well. Good question. Sweet, and it works. Um, on the topic of, well, great talk, thank you. Um, on the topic of uh, languages and baking security more effectively into languages uh, that we already use, um, I know that we're seeing more and more uh, start kind of working with the psychology of the human brain uh, by declaring functions that are blatantly unsafe as being mm -hmm. unsafe, right? Um, but I'm also seeing, at least uh, through some of the uh, through some of the application security work, software security work that that I and my team do, uh, I'm seeing more and more developers who are using such languages or frameworks that blatantly call out unsafe mm -hmm. procedures. I'm seeing more and more developers start doing them anyway, disregarding the like the innate language security. Uh, and saying, well, it's perfectly fine, it's not a big deal. So you're starting to see, at least in my anecdotal experience, a bit of a, like a crying wolf kind of problem. So what's the balance, do you think, between a language um, very clearly coming out and saying these functions are definitely mm -hmm. unsafe, but in some ways driving people to do what they want to do, ma but making that so cumbersome that developers start disregarding yeah. the warnings in the languages themselves? That's a great question, and, 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 and this is a great example of why these levers cannot be looked at independently. Because you cannot force advanced security function on an uneducated developer education. And, and, you know, and the more security is being looked at as a compliance mandate, the worse it is. You know. So the more... You, 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 you develop new techniques and new language along with the raising the proficiency, the security proficiency of your development organization, the less this type of, you will see this type of behavior. 
because developers will become smarter, number one, understanding why, but also, let's face it, in debating with the security team about the rule by itself. And what you end up is a much more collaborative process where the safety rule is not only set by a, a bunch of security experts, but where developers who know the software the best contribute to setting these rules. So look at these as you know, different levers, not just one in isolation. Eric, that was an awesome presentation. Way to, for me, for somebody that's kind of new to this, is systematize the whole thing. I took detailed notes and I got writer's cramp, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. My question is, now this is all fine and dandy, but how do you recommend to get people to the table? This is already people that are already socially, I mean, security aware that they want to do better, but I'm speaking more from like a, a small business perspective where it's always about the money. And I've ran into countless small businesses where it, it issue is um, I ask them, hey, I'll do a, um, AWS cloud stuff for them. And I'll ask them, when's the last time you did a security audit? Oh, the boss doesn't want to pay money for that. And I'll explain to them, mm -hmm. this is how you will because you'll get, you'll get breach. X, Y, Z will happen. And you're still going to pay the 60 grand to do the pen test or whatever the heck it is. So my question is, how do you, how do, would you recommend to break the ice to try and get them to at least be – open to the idea of starting this cultural change? I, I think it goes back to uh, the great question. Um, because uh, especially this, wha what you said becomes increasingly true in the application security space for connected device company. What we are dealing with with connected devices, they are, these are organizations that don't know they have become a technology company. They don't know they are a software organization. So if you don't know you are something, you don't know you have a problem, you know. And and so part of part of part of this goes back to point number one I made, which is the executive education. It is about educating, you know, the decision maker. Whether it's a, a typical network security case or whether it's up developing secure software, the same thing. You you need to have someone who will care and will we'll stand with you, you know, in, in the food chain. It starts with one level up, you know. Once you get one level up, you get two level up, you know, and you, 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 go, you, you, go, you, you go up the ladder. But without this sponsor, you will always be overruled, you know. So that would be my, my recommendation. Can we give him a huge applause? That was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.